Good morning, church. It's good to be able to see you guys today again. If you have your Bible, please grab it with you and turn it to Matthew chapter 8, verses 28 to 32, where we are going to be continuing on in our series here in the Gospel of Matthew. And this time we're going to be looking at the incredible story of Jesus Christ versus a demonic horde. Now, I'm... Uh, very aware that the subject for this morning may seem a bit odd for Mother's Day, but uh, hang in there. I have an explanation for uh, how this will fit together in the end. But needless to say, I know that the speaking about this subject, especially about demons, is a very uh, odd subject, you know, especially here in North America. North Americans, by and large, are a secular people. And I know that many people that we talk to and engage with, you know, as I go out and I share the gospel, I work with people, think that things like angels and demons are simply myths. They are relics from a bygone era and a past, a time in which people did not know how to explain phenomena and things that were happening around them in terms of scientific terms. And because of their ignorance, they attributed these strange happenings and things to supernatural beings. Of course, being we an enlightened people now today no longer need such things, and therefore we look for alternative explanations or dismiss this completely. Now, in one sense, I think this is actually disingenuous. And when I look and I think about the secular culture that we live in, I see sort of a double standard actually that's being applied. I find that though many people in times of peace and in everyday life would say they don't believe in these things, when it comes to times of crises, when there's tragedy that strikes, whether it's like the loss of a loved one, bankruptcy of your business, or perhaps actually there's a scam that causes you to lose all your money and basically your financial or even your health situation completely changes, all of a sudden they discover that many, many people are very willing to seek pastoral counsel or to look for actually spiritual help or to even consider the fact that there are demons or perhaps things that are at work here in the world. I remember I heard a story actually about a pastor who was called out late at a late hour basically to go and visit a man who had been given a terminal diagnosis in the hospital. And when the pastor got there, actually, the man said to him, oh, I'm sorry, no, I, I actually have no need of, of a pastor anymore. It was a mistake. And the pastor asked him why, what was going on. He says, well, I was given a diagnosis that I had cancer and I was going to be dying soon. I thought I needed spiritual help, but actually it turned out to be a false diagnosis, so I actually don't need a pastor anymore. This is such an odd thing, right? For, you know, people, you realize, like, you're actually going to die sometime or another. And just because you're scared now and you have this cancer diagnosis, do you think that all of a sudden, because it was a false diagnosis, you no longer need spiritual counsel? You see, do you see how fickle people are? You know, we need to consider these things because life and death is actually at stake. Now, even though many people, like I said, in times of peace, will profess, right, you know, to the fact that, no, I don't believe in such things or whatever. The way that they live, like you saw there in times of crisis, really shows something different. I think many people, actually, though they would say they believe that human beings are simply the products of evolutionary chance, there's nothing more to life afterwards, you turn back into dirt and you join with all the energy sort of in the universe, whatever it is that floats your boat. You know, uh, most people still find it very hard to believe that the loved one that they bury and who disintegrates in the ground is actually completely gone forever. You know, lots of these stories actually of people who love spending time at the graves and they often talk about how they feel like their loved one has spoken something to them or they take up a special hobby or a business or something like that in honor of their loved one who they felt, you know, is looking down from them from the sky somehow and communicating with them. You have others who say that, you know, even though they can't hear their loved one, they're convinced that their loved one is in a better place. The idea that human beings are just gone, even for secular people like us, who are so convinced of our scientific reasoning and our materialistic worldview, is very, very hard to stomach. And oftentimes we live with this strange sort of double standard. Now, it's interesting, I read this week a 2019 poll from the Pollard Group that was surveying Canadians in 2019. And the study found that most Canadians really are scientific-oriented, level-headed, modern people. And you can see this actually in some of the results that came out. 74% believe that humans are the product of evolution. 85% believe that climate change is real. Only 2% of Canadians believe that the Earth is flat. And only 3% uh, 
slightly larger than the flat earthers, believe that zombies exist or will exist in the future. Fascinating stat. But when it comes to the supernatural, 71% of the people they survey, and they believe of Canadians, believe that human beings have a soul. Only 22% of them completely reject the idea of there being a higher being or a divine power. The vast majority actually either believe in a, in a supernatural being or they are not certain about it. Very few are actually that certain that there isn't one. When it comes to ghosts, psychics, and uh, other things like this paranormal activity, less than 50% are willing to unequivocally declare that these things are fake. See, the study is fascinating because of the way that it summarizes Canadians. It basically says this, given that Canadians tend to generally display a need for evidence, some of the results may prove surprising, especially how many Canadians believe in ghosts, dousing, and psychic powers. See, other polls around other co countries in the world related to us are similar. 42% of Americans all, and 52% of Britons believe in spirits or ghosts. The Islamic world, if you come from that part, believes in the jinn, which are you know, evil spirits you know what I mean, that can harm or do things to people. In Asian countries, if you go, like the widespread belief in the demonic or spiritualist is just right through the roof. You look at Asia, like uh, Malaysia, Singapore, Taiwan, some of you who've been to these countries or have relatives there or even live there will know that, for example, on the seventh month in the lunar calendar is the month called the month of the hungry ghost. And this is celebrated actually in many of these Asian countries. People go out and they leave food for these spirits that perhaps have died, have no family to take care of them and could be upset, whatever, and they hope to placate or to appease these spirits. Bad things can happen to you, to your business, if you don't do this. In fact, many people will avoid swimming during this particular time. These are educated university graduates, and many people who are high up in society all observe these sort of traditions. Nobody wants to take the chance of ruining their life or death coming early for you by not dealing with these ghosts that have been talked about and known in their society for generation after generation, all over the place. Now. If you think this is only just a Western, maybe an Eastern phenomenon, it's actually broader than that. Dr. Justin McDan McDaniel is a professor at the University of Pennsylvania who studies these things. And he said this, Like in the West, people in Asia have kept their belief in ghosts despite the rise of science, skepticism, secularism, and public education. In the places like Japan, where secularism is very strong, the belief actually in ghosts is still high. Even hypermodern and liberal Scandinavia has a high percentage of people believing in ghosts. See, virtually every culture in the world deals actually with this idea of spirits, or even evil spirits. Even Hollywood understands this in our secular world, and they make tons of money out of supernatural thrillers and horror movies. They know how to make a dime out of it. And though we ourselves, Canadians, consider us to be, you know, people who are scientific, the truth of the matter is our hearts actually betray us in terms of what we believe by the way that we functionally believe. And I think that although many Canadians won't say it, the way that they live and the things that they, how they act, betrays the fact that we believe there's actually more to this world than meets the eye. You know what's so fascinating about the Bible is because the Bible actually tells us that the legends, in one sense, are true. Evil is actually real. It's not an abstract concept. There is a spiritual war. There are fallen angels, demons, who roam the earth. In the ancient days, there were giants, as recorded in the Bible. And you know, perhaps some of you here have had experience with this. You've seen dark things as a child. Maybe you suffered abuse. Maybe you've actually been involved in the occult in your life. You've had chills around people that you've been with who either you knew were Wiccans or practiced black magic or were into witchcraft or used perhaps like Ouija boards and stuff like that. Or you simply met people that you know weren't quite right and you had no sort of scientific explanation for it other than that, that there is something spiritually deeply wrong with it and it bothers you in your soul. See, the whole point of this is to say that the scriptures are correct. 
when Paul says in Ephesians that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against authorities, and against the cosmic powers and spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. There is a war that's actually going on around us. And you are right in the middle of it. And it rages around us and also at times near us and sometimes inside of us as well. All because there is a legitimate kingdom of darkness. But at the same time, as we look at our text today, what I want us to see here is that for us who are followers of Jesus, we don't need to be afraid of these things. We need to acknowledge that they are real. We need to acknowledge that they are powerful. But we also need to know with certainty in our hearts that Jesus Christ has supreme power and that against him, the kingdom of darkness, the gates of hell will not prevail against his church. They have no match. They are no match for his supreme power. So let's begin today, church, by looking at our text. We'll go through a couple of verses at a time. I'll stop and we'll look at them in detail. Look at verse 28 with me. And when he, Jesus, came to the other side, to the country of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men met him, coming out of the tombs, so fierce that no one could pass that way. Now, in this section, just like we saw previously, we are going to see a power encounter with Jesus, involving Jesus, and the message is going to be the same in that we are going to see the authority of Jesus, the divine one, who has power not just over nature itself, but also power now over demonic spirits. Now, the Greek word that we have here that we translate as demon possession in this case, or demonizomai, daimonizomai in our transliterated English, um, is a word that we have to, it's difficult actually to translate because it's dependent sort of on the context and also on the severity, okay? And let me explain that a bit, what I mean here. Here in this particular passage, in our Bibles, the word is translated as demon possession. And the reason it's translated as demon possession is because that's the most accurate thing of what's going on. The point is the demonic influence over this these individuals' lives is so severe that they've basically lost control over themselves. And the demons basically are the ones that are calling the shots now. And therefore, when we say that they're demon-possessed, we're saying that their case of demonization or daimonizomai is really, really bad. Now, you will find this word actually used at other different places in the scriptures, and you will notice, for example, the word is translated differently in those places. For example, in Matthew chapter 12, verse 22, this very same word is translated as demon-oppressed, and it's used to refer to a man who is a mute and blind. And when Jesus exercises the spirit of muteness and blindness from him, the man is actually able to see, and he's able to speak again. And there's actually a number of other places that are like this as well that speak about the demon oppressed as opposed to the demon possessed. Now, why this is important to understand is that this man in Matthew 12 seems to have his senses, and so do other people in the text. He's not able to speak, he's not able to see, but it's not like he's violent or unable to have his mind. So the point is that daimonizomai can be translated as possession or oppression depending on the context and how severe it actually is, okay? But it's not in the word itself. It depends on the things that we actually see in the text. It's an interpretive decision. For example, also, uh, not the same word, but the same idea is found as you look at in the scriptures. Let's say at Luke chapter 13, we read about a woman actually who has a disabling spirit and the Spirit, it says, has actually kept her bound, perhaps hunched over, for like 18 years. When Jesus comes and rebukes the Spirit and heals her, the Spirit's gone, the woman is freed, and basically from Satan's bondage. Again, this is another example of a demon that's actually inside an individual working in them, but the individual still retains her mind and her senses, okay? Just that her physical afflictions are the work and result of a demon, not a medical problem, okay? Another thing, for example, you read the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He actually talks about a messenger of Satan that was oppressive towards him, like a thorn in the flesh. Now, the point I'm trying to make here is that, again, as you can see, the scriptures, I think, are really clear that the way that demons work in our world can range from very, very severe 
to cases which are not as severe, and in some cases, lighter, all right? And it shows up in our bodies. Now, when we have problems that show up in our bodies, I want us to understand also that the Bible actually paints a comprehensive picture about how we are to think about the things that go wrong with us. Before we start jumping to the conclusion that every ache and pain and every problem, every lapse of your memory or anything that falls to the ground slightly wrong is the work of a demon, we need actually to consider the whole evidence of the scriptures and how the Bible handles the physical things that actually happen in life. There are four things actually I want to say. If there's something, let's say, that happens to you, let's say physically, um, you know, the, the problem, you know, could have, I think, at least one of four different things. These are very broad categories I'm going to get. One is, I think the Bible teaches us that an illness or a problem in our life could be the result of a physical thing. It could be medical. It could be a medical issue. Like, for example, when you look at 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 23, we have Paul here speaking to Timothy, and he tells Timothy, hey, Timothy, use a little wine for your frequent stomach ailments or your digestion, I think. Don't stop drinking water. And here's the Apostle Paul, not who has the power to heal people and do things, and you're wondering, why doesn't he just heal Timothy and so on? I'm like, no, the Apostle Paul believes that medicine works as well. And he's saying, Timothy, use some medicinal wine for your stomach. Help yourself in this way. God works through medicine as well. So your ailment in this particular case, Timothy, is not demonic, but it's simply, you know, medical. So go down to the yeah, no, the save on foods of the time. Go visit the pharmacy, pick up a bottle of wine and drink it, okay? Help yourself. So it's important to understand that we as Christians aren't against medicine, nor are we against the idea that some physical ailments and things that affect us have physical, medical solutions. The second one I would say is that sometimes our physical frame reacts actually because we actually have an emotional problem instead. For example, when you read about uh, it, most of us understand that when you go through grief, grief actually does a number of things to the body. It makes you more uh, stressed, can make you susceptible to illness and to disease. Many people who grieve often have heart problems and uh, blood pressure issues, all kinds of things. David, for example, when you read the Psalms, uh, especially when he's running away from his life from, from, from Saul, shows that his heart is actually tormented. His, his physical frame is bowing under the weight of the pressure, the, the emotional stress that he's under. In Psalm 55, which is perhaps a psalm from that period or a time when he's fleeing from other enemies, David shows that his heart's actually emotionally battered by the happenings around him. He actually cries out and says this, My heart's in anguish within me. The terrors of death have fallen upon me. Fear and trembling come upon me, and horror overwhelms me. See, you read from this that the guy is actually in emotionally rough shape as a result of enemies who are trying to attack him and take his life. See, and in times like this, the solution is actually not pharmaceuticals. It's not wine. Don't go and drown your troubles in that. The particular solution in this particular case to emotional problems like this, in which you feel the weight of the world on you, is friends. You know, the, the Proverbs speak a lot, actually, about friends. There's a friend that sticks closer than a brother, and a brother is actually born for adversity. You read the solution, actually, to when David is running away from Saul, being chased in the wilderness in 1 Samuel 23. He doesn't go to the drugstore. He doesn't pop open a bottle of wine and drown his sorrows. Instead, we read that Jonathan hears about it. And in 1 Samuel 23, 16, Jonathan, his dear friend, runs to David at Inziv, and he says, the text says that he strengthened his hand in God. This is why it's so critical to understand that sometimes, especially in a pandemic like this, what you simply need when you're crushed under the weight of the world is not an exorcism of a demon. It's not a misdemeanor solution, but it's actually a friend. A friend that is actually going to speak biblical truth to you to remind you of the truths about God and strengthen your hand in the Lord. That's how you deal with the emotional. Now, there's a third category, which is the spiritual. Sometimes bodily ailments and the things that we experience are the result of unconfessed sin. Psalm 32 says this about unconfessed sin can lead to you feeling like your bones are wasting away. The psalmist says that my strength is actually dried up as in the heat of summer. James 5 actually corroborates this by talking about cases in which an individual is very sick. They actually call for the elders of the church. They confess their sins to the elders. The elders anoint them with oil and they pray for them. And it says the, 
the prayers of the righteous are effective, and God will raise them up. So, in this case, this, the, the physical ailments or the fact that they're on their deathbed is actually a, a spiritual problem, and it's the result of sin and therefore requires a spiritual intervention. Now, the fourth case is the one that we're talking about today. In some cases, physical dysfunction is the result of demonic activity. In Matthew chapter 17, for example, we read about a boy who is given to epileptic seizures, or in the Greek here, seleniatsomi, right? So this demon tries to destroy him by throwing him into the fire and drowning him actually in water. Mark 9 actually records more stuff about this boy, saying that the spirit actually is also a mute and a deaf spirit. Now, as I just mentioned earlier, it's important for us to understand this. Not all illness is the result of demonic activity. There's already three other examples, physical, emotional, and spiritual, that I've shown you of where these illnesses can come from as well. But the point is this. Some illnesses may be the result of these physical and medical problems, you know, um, uh, physical and medical problems, but not all are. In this case that I just read, the epileptic seizures are the result of actually a demon. However, if you read just earlier uh, in the book of Matthew, chapter 4, verse 24, we actually find types of epileptic seizures that are not the result, for example, of demonic activity. Matthew 4, 24 says this about Jesus' healing. It says, those afflicted with various disease and pains, these are the ones healed by Jesus, those who were also oppressed by demons, daimonitsumai, as I mentioned earlier, those having seizures, the seliniatsumi in the Greek here, and paralytics. So do you notice what Matthew has done here? He's actually separated paralytics from the demon oppressed and also from the, uh, those who are having seizures or the epileptics. In other words, what he's saying is that there is a category of those who are having seizures that are having, being simply healed by Jesus and not having a demon cast out of him, and then there are others who are demon-oppressed. Same word right here for seizures. Two different causes in the scriptures. One is demonic, and the other one is probably a medical thing, both of which Jesus is able to treat. Okay? Same thing actually goes for blindness. In Matthew chapter 12, we read about a demon that is the result uh, that causes a man's blindness. And, but in John chapter 9, we read about a man who's born blind, actually, and there's no demon actually present in that. So, again, all this to say, all, all this to say is that some things are the result of demons, but there are also three other categories that we need to consider when we're looking at ailments and things that are plaguing Christians and uh, non-Christians. Now, the four categories that I just outlined are very helpful to us, but they're not mutually exclusive. And in fact, they can actually be combined. They're not just clean-cut things. For example, you think about number two and three, emotional and spiritual. You look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, which says, Husbands, basically live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the women as the weaker vessel. The reason why is if you don't, your prayers actually will be hindered. So in other words, what it's saying here, if we look at it through the categories, is if you, number two, are not emotionally in sync, or in sync with your spouse and you're treating your wife poorly, and obviously it's wrong to do that, to be harsh with them, you incur actually a type of number three, spiritual sin against God, and you can actually ruin your life. All kinds of stresses come in marriage as a result of, especially when you're sinning against God. You can combine numbers one and four, for instance. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, I already spoke about Paul talking about a messenger from Satan who is like a thorn in the flesh. And most people think that this was actually a physical ailment that Paul actually had as a result of demonic activity. So this is a combination of a physical thing as well as something which is demonic. God says to him, though, my grace is sufficient for you. And he has Paul continue on, soldier on with this uh, affliction and this ailment. Another one, for example, is you can combine number two and four, the emotional and the demonic. Ephesians chapter four, verse 26 says this, don't let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. See, in other words, what he's saying here is that he's making a connection between your emotions, your state of being, your anger that you're, that you're being roused with. And he's saying, you be really careful with this because you actually might open a door in your anger, the murderous rage, to allowing more 
evil things to come into your life and give Satan an opportunity to work through you to accomplish his nefarious purposes. See, I just gave a few examples of how these things can be combined. But my whole point is this. The biblical worldview is a multi-dimensional worldview that is actually far broader and far more comprehensive than the modern secular worldview. The worldview that we have in North America today only knows how to deal with categories number one and number two. So in other words, if the problem is physical, you treat it with medicine, you dose it with pills, you try to have some sort of medical intervention. But if the problem is emotional and in the person's mind, then you try to deal with it with things like counseling, friends, therapy, psychiatry, and all sorts of things. But only Christians have the tools to deal with a problem if the problem is a result of sin in a person's life. The secular world has nothing to do with that, does not know how to deal with this. The secular world does not deal with confession of sin and sin against God or anointing with oil. The secular world has nothing on that. Another thing, for example, that we have here is number four when we think about it. Now, in number four, the secular world also has nothing that it can do. Number four is about demonic activity. And though many people in our world today, you know, will say that they don't believe, you know, in demons. And, you know, maybe some will in our world and Canadians who betray their belief in the spiritual. The point is this. They have no tools whatsoever to how to deal with it. I don't know when's the last time that I've seen anybody in either medical school, a psychological textbook, or even wrote a manual for use in a government organization or a workplace or facility that says, in the event that demons enter your workplace or that you encounter these sort of things, here's a 10-step process that you can be demon-free. You know, three easy payments of 1995. Here's your solution. Nobody does that, you know what I mean, in our world. I mean, this, you know, we understand that there is something about the spiritual world that's real, but honestly, North Americans are probably the least equipped, the most frightened, actually, when it comes to dealing with these things. Now, What I want to say is, uh, even though the categories are linked, and it takes discernment to figure out what to do with them, I think what's clear in the scriptures is that Jesus actually has to be the solution to all of those things. Nothing actually falls outside his purview. And also, the other thing that's important for us to understand in this passage is just because you're not demon-possessed, like these guys, doesn't mean that you cannot be influenced, attacked by, or assaulted, actually, by demons. It doesn't mean that they're not at work in your life, stirring up things which are evil or sinful. Now, see, when Jesus arrives, we're told here that, you know, he encounters these two men, and Mark and Luke, for instance, basically say that, look, there was uh, one guy, you know, and um, it's not a contradiction, right? I think Matthew is actually t telling us who was actually there, where Mark and Luke are focusing on the one guy, who was actually repentant, wanted to follow Jesus, did most of the talking, and so on. The point is that Mark and Luke furnish us with an additional detail that this individual, these individuals were extremely strong. They were able to tear apart chains, basically, and break them, and nobody could contain them. Now, why this is interesting is because it may sound odd to us that such a supernatural power could actually exist, but... Um, you know, I would say that people in our world, especially in Asia and solid Christians that I've heard testimony from, and including myself, have seen things like this and experienced stuff, uh, which is cannot be explained other than supernatural means. In North America, actually, there's an example. Dr. Richard Gallagher is actually a board-certified psychiatrist who trained at Yale at Princeton, and he was originally a very skeptic uh, adherent uh, of the Catholic Church. And it, but the Catholic Church started involving him in some of their work dealing with I individuals that they felt were demonically possessed. And after spending 25 years working as alongside Vatican exorcists, basically, he became convinced of the validity and the truthfulness of the reality of demons. Now, he admits that actually the majority of the cases that he sees are actually cases that are psychiatric and involved that need, they just need mental help. But there are a minority of cases that he says that are undeniably de demonic. And he notes that actually more and more health professionals are starting to speak up about these strange experiences that they're having, happening, even though they're afraid they're going to be ostracized by the medical community and secular people around them 
for saying things like that that seem so unscientific. There's no better explanation. In fact, in his book, he tells one story, his book called Demonic Foes, he actually tells a story about how he saw a tiny woman, some 90 pounds, who was actually possessed by a demon. And she actually threw, he says, a 200-pound Lutheran deacon across the room to the horror of the onlookers in a church hall. Now, he has other stories like this, but I can attest to his own things. In my time as a pastor and in people that I dealt with, everyone from things with people who have dealt with the occult, people who have been possessed by demons, those who have dabbled in things that they should not have, those who have gone into wicked sin that in some cases is illegal and, you know, they had to consult with the police, you know, about there are horrible things, you know, that I've seen. I've heard demons within people scream, threaten, uh, rage, actually, uh, you know, say that they're going to do harm. They say things, I've heard them say things like, you have no power here, you have no strength, you know, you're too late, you know, we'll never obey, you know, and there's this strangest dealing with some of these people, they go dark, they have these unnatural voices, these blood-curdling screams. And um, the interesting thing is that when you bring in Jesus or Scripture, they hate it. They can't stand before it. And some people are, are kind of chilled by that when I talk about it, and I don't want to make a big deal about those things. I mean, uh, dealing with the demonic should be a, a normal part of our lives, but uh, you know, I don't want to build a ministry on knowing it's like, oh, you're the ex, you know, you're an exorcist. Well, I'm not really. I mean, I mean, I've dealt with this, you know, before. But my whole point is this: I, I think honestly, as a as a Christian, in, in times that I've dealt with this, I've never actually felt fearful. In fact, seeing actually the demonic right in front of me is like I felt seeing a a, a first row seat into the heavenly realms or the spiritual realms in which I see the truthfulness of a war that's actually taking place. I feel that with Jesus as my Savior and Him walking with me, I'm guarded, I'm protected under the blood of the Lamb. And these evil creatures only lie and say things and try to convince you like a roaring lion, scaring you, hoping to just scare you. But the lion has no teeth actually against those who belong to Jesus. Now, in the case of these individuals, right, I mean, they're demonized. They can't live in society, so they're stuck, basically, on the outskirts, you know, of society. They roar, and they are dangerous, actually, because of people left on their own devices without the blood of Jesus, without the power of Jesus. These things are extremely dangerous. When they see Jesus Christ, though, look how they react. Verse 29 says this, And behold, they cried out, what have you to do with us, O Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? See, do you know what's so fascinating about this is that these demons actually recognize that Jesus is the Son of God, and they call him that. Now, no one else has referred to Jesus as the Son of God up to this point except one character in the whole of the Gospels. And that character is actually Satan. Calls him the Son of God. Nobody else fully understands who Jesus is at this point, okay? Not even his followers who are close to him even grasp what he is. But the demons actually do, and they're terrified of him. And the crazy thing is, despite the fact that no man is actually able to stand up to the demons on their own strength, on their own power, the minute that the demons see Jesus, they realize they're no match for him, and they cower in fear from him. And their chief worry, they say here, is they're worried that Jesus is coming here to judge them and torment him before the time. And what they're referring to here is the time of judgment at the end of the world in which people understood that the demons actually will be thrown into the lake of fire along with all the ungodly and sentenced to an eternal hell. See, they don't want that. They know it's coming for them, but they don't want it. And in fact, it's interesting, though they know that eternal punishment is coming for them, they refuse to repent and they actually continue on with their evil behavior. But because they know they're outmatched, they turn instead to negotiation. Verses 30 to 32 says this. Now a herd of many pigs was feeding at some distance from them. And the demons begged him saying, if you cast us out, send us away into the herd of pigs. And the demons begged him, uh, uh, sorry, and he said to them, go. So they came out and went into the pigs. And behold, the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the waters. Now it's, it's this is really interesting, right? Because here, you have the demons actually asking for a concession. And the concession that they ask for, basically, is not that they just be cast out, but the concession that they ask for is that they be cast out and be thrown into the pigs. Now, why this is so interesting, right, is because you can read also in Matthew chapter 12, 
verses 43 and 45, about Jesus talking about what happens to demons that are forced actually to leave, uh, you know, a host or a person. When they leave a person, Jesus says, they actually wander around into these waterless places. And I guess feeling kind of restless, he says, they seek rest by looking for a new host. And in the case where the house has been swept out, uh, you know, through an exorcism or something like that, they go back and they want to make more trouble. And in fact, they can bring seven more demons, more wicked than themselves, to go in and do this. So the whole point is this. Uh, demons, according to the scripture, have one purpose. They want to kill and to destroy. And therefore, they like being inside of a living host in order to carry out their destructive programming. But amazingly, when Jesus gives them permission and he says, go, these demons also obey him in a moment and they go. Now, in the ancient world, nobody could do this. Nobody commanded power over demons like this. We don't have any examples like this except Jesus, who has an incredible amount of authority. He says, go, and they move. And the result is immediate. Now, what happens is the demons actually in the scriptures leave their human host. They go into the pigs. The pigs are actually maddened. The insanity that the men had, it seems to be passed to the pigs. They race down the steep bank, and they're all drowned in the sea because the demons are controlling them. How do the people respond? Look with me at this, at verses 33 to 34 here in the text. The text says, The herdsmen fled, and going into the city, they told everything, especially what had happened to the demon-possessed men. And behold, all the city came out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they begged him to leave their region. Now, it's fascinating, right, this text, because, I mean, it could have said that they begged Jesus to stay and they wanted to worship him and be his followers and so on like that. I mean, but it says the opposite. I mean, the herdsmen go home. They tell everybody about what's happened on us with the herd of pigs. And it says especially what happened with the demon-possessed man, men. But instead of praising him, they say, we don't want you here. Leave. And the question for us is, why did they say that? And I think the answer to that question is actually directly connected to why actually Jesus allowed the demons to go into the pigs in the first place. I mean, it's actually really odd if you think about it, you read your Bible, there is no other instance of an exorcism in which Jesus actually commands spirits to leave and sends them into something else. He could actually have just said, no, to them, because you can see the demons actually ask his permission to go into the pigs. In other words, Jesus is the one who actually allows them to go into the pigs. Why? Now, I think there's actually five, at least five reasons for why Jesus, five or six reasons why Jesus actually does this, okay? Let me me give it to you. One is, I think, Jesus, for our benefit, for those around him, shows actually the level of demonization and the size of this demonic horde. You know, Mark and Luke actually tell us that the herd of pigs was about 2,000 and all of them perished in the water. And also that the man actually spoke and the demon said, our name is Legion because we are many. There literally were thousands of demons in this one particular human host and they were tormenting the man. The second thing I think is that it actually highlights for us the incredible wickedness of demons. Now, though the drowning of a few pigs actually seems kind of pointless. I mean, what's the point of going into a bunch of pigs that are going to die and then you lose your next host? It's just a few minutes. But I mean, we all understand what it's like. I've seen teenagers and people, you know, who love setting fires and doing crazy things, you know, you know, stuff. Why? Or uh, driving their car and even getting it destroyed in a demolition derby all for a few minutes of fun. And you ask the question, why? I'm like, Well, I think some are just literally enjoy seeing things destroyed. There are some people or individuals that just like seeing the world burn. And I think that demons are actually in that category. They just revel in destruction. And if they can have only a few more minutes of that, even if it's in a pig's body, they want it badly and they will take it in a heartbeat. It's evil, actually, in its purest, unadulterated form. Third thing, I think, actually, the reason he does it is actually shows to the men and the people around him incontrovertible proof of the men's healing. I mean, how do you see that something has transpired in the invisible spiritual realm? Well, the fact that he heals them and the madness of the men seems to go uh, to make the pigs mad suggests that there has been an invisible transaction that has taken place. The men actually are totally healed as the demons are transferred from him 
over to the pigs. The fourth reason I think that, we sh that is in here is that it shows actually the incredible power, immense power of Jesus Christ. Now, nobody in the ancient world did anything like this. So this sets Jesus far above any other religious teacher or exorcist of his day. The fifth thing I think that it shows us here is the huge value of human life. Now, the loss of a herd is immense here. It was a huge financial catastrophe. And animal activists actually, I think, would be very upset with this today. If the SPCA got a hold of this, they would not like this one bit. But the point is this. If you and I had to choose between the death of 2,000 pigs that you know, we would cook and we would eat with, as bacon and so on like that, and if 2,000 pigs could save a human being's life, wouldn't we do it? Yes, we would. Because we know there's a huge difference, qualitative difference between the life of animals and the life of a human being. There's just no comparison whatsoever, okay? Human beings are made in the image of God, pigs are not. The sixth thing here is this. It's actually, I think, to show the incredible hardness of the human heart. Now, you remember that the people of the town here actually got a first-hand glimpse of the power of Jesus as they witnessed what he had done in not only the testimony of the men who actually had been healed, but also with those uh, who had seen the destruction of the herd of pigs. Instead, actually, what you realize is their eyes are so, their minds are so concerned either with the profit loss from the pigs, their financial destruction, or their fear at a Jesus like this who can do something like this, that instead of feeling elation, they're actually threatened by this miracle. So they're not amazed at this Jesus who just freed these men from bondage to Satan, but they actually find themselves terrified and they want nothing to do with him. You know, truly, if their eyes were open and they were wise, they would have been open to the spiritual reality of what has occurred. They would have valued the kingdom of God. They would have seen the pearl of great price. They would have found the treasure that is hidden in the field. And they would have said, forget about the pigs, Jesus. We want you. You are the son of God. We want you. We need you in our lives. 2,000 pigs is nothing compared to the fact that we have you. You see, and there's a lesson here for all of us. There's so many people in this world who are blind to just the incomparable value of Jesus Christ and his kingdom that even when they're presented with a miracle, an unbelievable miracle that nobody else could replicate except God himself, and it's weighed up against financial loss or things that are really important to them in their life, they say, nope. My finances and the things that I know, my comforts, my, everything that I know, I know it's rough in this life. That's more important to me than dealing with these miracles of the Son of God. I will choose that. Now, I really like what D.A. Carson said. Basically, these people preferred pigs to persons. They preferred swine to the Savior. Now, I don't know what pigs cost then, but today if you look up a pig, I went on Craigslist and I found that you can buy pigs uh, from farms around here for like 250 bucks. Okay, So $250 for a pig. Uh, let's say uh, 2,000 pigs here is about $500,000. That's half a million dollars. Now, if that was you, and you lost half a million dollars in one go, and those were your pigs, I think you'd be kind of upset, you know, with that level of loss. This is a significant loss, okay? Probably maybe worth more in that time. But the point is this. If Jesus were to show up in your life, and you were, saw him and his power, and he told you, Leave behind your house that's worth half a million dollars, which buys you virtually nothing in Vancouver today, but leave behind that house or those things that you have. Leave behind your million-dollar home, whatever you have, and come and follow me. Or because of that, you need to sell it. Or because you're my follower, you're going to be persecuted, and people are going to destroy it. They're going to seize it and take it. Will you still follow me? And the question that we have to ask is ourselves, do we value Jesus more than the other things that are valuable in the economy and the finances of this world? See, what is it that we ultimately want? Would we gladly pay the price or would we resent God if such a thing happened to us? How will we respond? See, everyone cheers for the healing of like two demonics. Wow, that's amazing. But what if the healing of people, the saving of souls could only occur at great cost to yourself? Would you still be happy at the work of God? What if I told you that the work of God here would only go forward if we as Christians were to sacrifice financially and sacrifice of your time, your energy, and your weekends here so that other people in the society who might be demon-possessed, who actually have no reason to want to come to the church whatsoever, if only we were willing to sacrifice greatly, they would find life in Jesus. Would you be willing to pay the price? That's the question actually that faces us from this text here. 
You know, there's two things I want to say, friends, as actually we wrap this up, two applications. One is, let's think from the perspective of the demon-possessed men. Maybe there's some of you here who are grappling actually with demons right now in your life. You have problems that aren't explained by physical, emotional, or spiritual things, and you are dealing with the forces of darkness. Something's actually shackling you from moving forward. You've tried all these things, but what you need, perhaps, is to confess these things to God. Go to God and say, Jesus, I need your power to deal with these demons. Maybe you're not a believer, actually, and you're listening to this thing, and there's been weird things happening in your life, and God has been getting your attention with the supernatural. What you need is the power of Jesus right now to break the forces of darkness. You need to claim that. You need to call on Jesus and let him heal you and transform you and change you. Talk to Jesus. Come to him. He can set you free. Now, some of us maybe are demonized, or we are being harassed by demons, and we still need the power of Jesus in this way. But honestly, this story actually is not just about the men who were possessed, but also about the crowds, those who were in the Gadarene region, and how they responded to Jesus. And my question for us is, how will we respond to him when we see his work? You hear his word. You hear about his promises. You hear about his truths. You see the miracles of Jesus with your mind's eye. You see him crucified as the Galatians did because we have his word spoken to us today. And my question for you today is, do you have pigs in your life? I'm not talking about the cute little porkers, you know what I mean, that, you know, we turn into bacon, you know, or some people keep as pets. No, I am talking about the things in your life that are financially valuable or maybe even ugly things in your life that you just can't get rid of. Some of you are holding on to them and you know you shouldn't be holding on to them. Some of you are holding on to them and they're nice pigs, they're clean pigs. You know, they're really good ones, you know, instead, but they are taking over your life. And because of these things, you look at the work of Jesus and you look at him calling to you and you say, I can't. I can't. It's fine, Jesus. You do all that work. Seek first the kingdom of God. I want you to be free demoniacs and stuff, but, but don't touch my time. Don't touch my energy and don't touch my finances. You can have my 10%, but I'll protect the other 90% with my guns. You know, that's the way sometimes we are. See, and if that's actually you, and you find yourself this way, you find it hard actually to follow God, do these things, you might actually have a type of pig in your life, something that is ultimately unclean, preventing you from moving forward. It enslaves you. It could be your career. It could be your children, a lover, a hobby. But the point is, it, it, you keep trying to feed this thing and you can't live without it. And my friends, that's idolatry. And it's got to be let go. See, the question is, are you willing actually to give it up to Jesus? Or do you see the removal of it from your life through his power as actually a threat to you and you want Jesus to move along and say, go bother someone else? No, Jesus, don't tell my pigs to go, but I command you, Jesus, actually to go. And you exercise him functionally from your life by the way that you live. See, the question here is not about whether or not you actually experience an exorcism or a casting out. All of us actually do this. The question is whether you allow God to cast out the things in your life that are preventing you from following him or you are practicing exorcism and casting God out of your life and saying, I will not follow you. That's the challenge actually that faces us here. Do you want to know actually if you're a believer? It's when actually God comes into your life, shows his power, does amazing things. It's very costly for you to follow him. And yet you say, I'll gladly pay the cost, God. I have found the pearl of great price. I have found the treasure hidden in the field. No matter what I pay, whether it's with my house or whether it's with my very own life or with my family, I'll pay it all simply because you, Jesus, are far more valuable, far more beautiful to me. And if I have you, I have everything. You give up everything, financial security, where you want to live, your own peace, your weekends simply to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. That's evidence that you belong to the king and that you will follow him like that man did and get into the boat and leave everything behind. Now I said earlier today, I like, I know it's Mother's Day and like how on earth is this applicable to mothers? You know, I was thinking about, uh, about this, to, you know, as I was wrestling through this passage and I was just thinking, I'm like, oh yeah, I think this is applicable to mothers. And especially for those of you mothers who are Christians and you love Jesus and you have labored in a very thankless kind of work, raising children, working over your home, cleaning up spills and things for like the upteenth time, whatever, 
wiping the puke off the floor. I, I, I just think about, even as a mom, you can't even go to the bathroom in peace without somebody banging on the door, trying to kick it open because something happened and they need a crayon, right? And stuff like that. There's, there's nowhere you can go for peace. I mean, even Susanna Wesley, who had like 10 children, talked about her times of peace when she took her apron and put it over her head and it became the sacred tent of meeting in which she communed with God. I mean, that's how you feel sometimes as a mother. And my encouragement to those of you who are listening to this on Mother's Day is that if that's you and you feel like the only sanity that you have is that you put your apron over your head and you're this close to a madness that almost feels like demonic possession, my point is this. God is with you. He's through the storm. He watches you and he sees you. And if you do what you do because you are a follower of Jesus Christ and you have sacrificed on the altar your time, your energy, your own wants, your desires, You're like this man instead who has been freed. You have gotten into the boat and you have followed Jesus. You are not one who continues to live with these demons. You are not the apathetic responders of those who are in the Gadara region and says, God, you threaten what I really want. Get out of here and go. You have said yes to Jesus and you're in his boat. And though life may have storms, though it may have winds, as long as you're with Jesus, it's going to be okay. You follow the king of kings. And even if nobody sees your work, And nobody values you for what you do. Your king sees the service of your heart and has promised you an eternal reward. For those of us who are not mothers here, ours is the same. We follow the king. We lay up the things at his feet, all those things that he gifts us with and says, none of these things are valuable compared to you. We can trust Jesus because you realize that ultimately this story is about the Jesus who gave it all for us. You think about it, Jesus actually, uh, you know, took on himself the disease of sin that was over us, went down into the waters of death, and he was our substitute, unlike a pig or a goat or a bull that can do nothing for us. He died so that we could live. Jesus went, Christ went down into the waters of death so that we could actually find life. See, he could save the man from his physical ailments, these spiritual ailments, by sending these things into the pigs. But in order to save us from the greater sin and the problems, effects of death, he actually had to go down into the waters of the judgment of God himself. See, there is actually a great story here, and that's the story of Jesus Christ on the cross. And see, friends, he calls to us today. He calls to us to submit to him, to love him and to obey him. And he does so not from a position in which he lords it over us, but as one who loves us and who gave it all for us. So church, friends, those of you who are listening today, will you trust him? Will you follow him? Will you go with your master wherever he calls you to go? Sacrifice anything for what he asks you to give because he is worth it. And he is beautiful and valuable. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much, God, for being our Lord and our God. Father, we thank you that the Son of God came into this world to save us from the things that enslave us and that she has given us power over demons and we don't need to be afraid. Father, even if we encounter these creatures, we have power in Jesus' name to command them to leave. But even, Father, if we encounter things, God, in our lives that distract us from following you, And tempt us to say, take me and have me over Jesus. Give us, O God, the ability to see Jesus for the beauty that he is. And to say, no, everything else is a fleeting pleasure compared to Jesus. I want Jesus over everything. Father, even if it should cost us our own lives, help us to look forward to the joy that is set before us in heaven. Father, I pray for mothers today. I pray for those who are suffering. I pray for those, O God, who have found it costly to follow Jesus because they have held to their integrity and they have not moved. Father, I pray that you remind them today that Jesus is their Lord. His authority extends over all things, whether it's the demons that are real and that attack us or the demons of our own lives that threaten to consume us from the inside. God, you are Lord. Father, we find hope in Jesus Christ and we thank you for his shed blood. In his name we pray.